Okay, um, thanks Stan and the organizers, administrative staff for organizing the meeting and having me here. So, um, let me start the talk by uh, giving you a prologue before getting into the actual context. So, I'm interested in memories because I think we are our memories and it's a, it's a really important part of our, our personalities. And um, if you look at the course of evolution, um, formation of memories and, 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 and discovering new forms and mechanisms of memory has always led to major evolutionary changes. I mean, thinking about from the DNA and RNA to epigenetic mechanisms to the different forms of memory that, that you know, through the nervous system has, um, have, have emerged. Um, they have always led to fundamental changes in the, in the way information gets processed. And I think we really don't have a very good theory of, 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 uh, of memory formation at various stages of, of biological evolution. Um, but there are clear examples of, this, of these changes. One of them that I will talk about a bit more is um, the change that happened in, in the brain of uh, reptiles. From, this, is a, this is a cross section of the brain of a, of a lizard. And uh, th there's something you can identify. This is called the, the medial pallium. And from lizards to, to reptiles, the homologue of this region um, is, uh, is the medial pallium of the, of, the, uh, of the mammals. Four of them are shown here. And this change has led to the formation of a new, very fundamental memory device in our brain, which uh, we call the hippocampus. And it's a very intricate structure. There's a lot of work done on it. Uh, we know it is heavily involved in various forms of memory. I will talk about some of them today. But I think you know, this, this probably has had a huge impact on, on the way mammals process information. So I'd really like to think that uh, we are our memories plus language, which uh, could also be memory. And uh, uh, if you're interested in that kind of discussion, what is language and how it relates to memory, I'm giving you after our discussion in February on, on this issue. But after this um, philosophical kind of viewpoint that, uh, that I'd like to share with you, um, I'd like to talk about several things that during the past, say, 30, 40 years, we've learned about the formation of the memories in the nervous system, the work that uh, various people have done, including myself. Um, I will talk about um, storing discrete memories in neural networks. <coughs> Then I'll talk about storing continuous variables, focusing on the case of space, how we form memory of space and, and the nervous system. And then I'll try to touch on what I call more complex manifolds, which we'll define later and, and you'll probably see what I mean by them. Um, so the, the, the earlier work on, um, on the formation of memory in the nervous system goes back to the ideas that were learning and memory are related to synaptic plasticity in the nervous system. And with that was the idea that was proposed by Donald Hepp in this very substantial and influential book, Organization of Behavior, where um, he proposed the following idea, that if you get two neurons, this one and this one, and uh, they're connected to each other through a synapse, if they happen to be co-active, their connection gets stronger and that this, this stronger connection will, will stay there even after the, the activity has subsided. Well, this was the main idea. At the time, there was no direct evidence for it. It was a proposal, and so Donald Hebb in his book wrote that when one cell repeatedly sits in firing another, the axon of the first cell develops synaptic knobs um, in contact with the soma of the second cell. This seems to me the most likely mechanism of a lasting effect of reverberatory action, but I wish to make it clear that, then he discusses further details of the matter and why, what, what, what he thinks about this issue, because this was not something that was seen at the time and was observed afterwards only. And essentially, he proposed the following idea, that uh, you know, in your nervous system, once you um, 
see an object, say an apple, this apple produces a pattern of activity in these neurons in the network where this pattern of co-activity leads to um, uh, stronger connections between these neurons so that next time even if you have a partial cue of an apple um, which activates only say half of the neurons here, the reverberation of current through these um, stronger connections will activate the whole thing and this can s stay there as a stable pattern of activity even after the, the, the actual object is gone. So this was kind of the um, main, uh, what you can call a word model of, of uh, how you can store memories in the nervous system, how you can activate them and, and uh, keep them in your what's called more working memory. And then after some point, of course, the activity subsides. Um, so this was the idea of heavy and cell assemblies and um, of course, you know, you can do it for uh, multiple objects and each object will, will recruit a bunch of new cells put and some that, that overlap with the previous one and you know, you will eventually have a, a network that has stored a number of patterns in it and it was the, the discovery of John Hopfield that, uh, that led to a lot of work by the physicists in this area and that was the observation that um, you can formalize this network by um, associating, say, a plus one to, to um, an active neuron and a minus one to an inactive neuron. Um, you can write a Hamiltonian that describes the dynamics of a network like this if the neurons are active or they are not active. And that if you have a particular way of storing these patterns, which is for each particular pattern, you increase the weight if the two neurons are connected to each, are, are co-active, and you do this for every new pattern, um, you can describe essentially the, 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 a system like this with an order parameter, which is um, the overlap between the um, stored patterns and the current activity of the network, and that these, these, these um, patterns happen to be uh, minima, local minima of some sort of free energy of, the, of, a, of a system like this, okay? This was a, an idea that was very, very influential. Uh, so you will have this local minima in a free energy associated to the system um, which correspond to the stored patterns and you also have, um, of course, mixtures, things that, things that you did not store but they just happen to be there as a result of the process that you just manipulated the weights. Um, so this was, a, uh, this was the, the uh, mathematical framework that was developed and then another influential piece of work was, was this work by late Danny Meat and Hanoch Gottfreund and Heim Sompolinsky uh, where they studied how you can actually analyze this um, mathematically. So what the idea was that you can use techniques from um, statistical physics, spin glasses, to analyze the properties of this free energy landscape and see where the, where the minima are, um, whether they have the properties you want them to have, uh, when are they stable, and they, they managed to make a phase diagram by calculating essentially the free energy of the, of the system averaged over the different realizations of the, of the stored patterns that you could have. And what they came up with was this by now very famous um, um, phase diagram where, uh, what you can see here, that's the place that you have to really pay attention, is there's a, there's a line here as a function of the temperature, the level of noise, and the number of stored patterns, fraction of stored patterns, which is called the storage capacity, um, and there is a transition at uh, point 14138, uh, which below which you can, you, you can retrieve the memories that you stored, and after that, you cannot, okay? So this, this, I think, was the starting point of a lot of physicists moving into this field and, and, uh, and um, you know, using these tools to analyze various forms of this. You can, you can play around with the, with the, with the um, different uh, details of the model, type of neuron that you're adding, type of noise, different learning rules. And you essentially always get the same picture with different transitions and, and that was that, that, was, uh, that was kind of the first, I think, um, theoretical understanding of models of, of, of memory which, which involved some um, serious calculations. This was all on 
memory of discrete objects. That is, you have one pattern of, one pattern of activity associated to a particular object or, or, or episode or something in the, in the outside world, and, and you want to store those. One thing that is um, probably you will all agree with is that um, in addition to point attractors or points that, 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 that you want to um, associate to certain objects in the world, there are other variables that, that ha take a continuum and they are not um, necessarily discrete points. Um, you, can, you can use the same idea as, as, the, as the Hopfield model, think about um, what's called a continuous attractor. Now, your free energy doesn't have this localized minima that are separated from each other with some basin of attraction, but you have some sort of continuum in the free energy landscape that, that your network can kind of slide along. And where it is in that continuum encodes a type of um, uh, memory of a continuous variable. So say a, a very simple implementation of this that you know, has been actually used for um, describing memory of a space is what's called, what we call the ring attractor. So what, what, what I'm showing here is a, is a set of uh, units, neurons, on a, on a line, perhaps with some periodic boundary conditions. You have some sort of uh, interaction pattern, which in this case is, has a long-range inhibition um, and short-range excitation. So nearby cells tend to excite each other. F those that are further away, they tend to inhibit each other. And you just have a simple relationship of the activity of one neuron as a function of the activity of other neurons and the interaction that they have. And this interaction is translational invariant. This is some sort of uh, gain function or transfer function that transfers the input that each neuron receives to the output that, that it will produce. And uh, you can convince yourself that this will have a stable translational invariant profile of activity. Okay? Um, it, is, uh, it is translationally invariant in the sense that this activity, if it's stable here, it is also stable here or marginally stable here. You can slide along and this is essentially the direction and the, ma the manifold of the free energy where, where um, you, have a, you have a marginal stability direction. So the, the simple idea would be that, for instance, you can use the position of this pattern of activity here as where an object is or where the animal is in a space. Um, to do that, though, you need to do uh, a little, another trick, which is your, your, your pattern of activity, you need to move it along with the animal. So if there is an animal that is moving on a linear track in order to store the memory of, of, of where the animal is, you have to be able to move this. And to do this, you essentially need external input about the, about, um, about the locomotion of the animal. And there are neurons that, that signal those things in the nervous system. So that's not very difficult to do. Um, so this is, this is a, a kind of a, mm, a formalized, uh, simple model for, for how you can store memories in the, uh, of, 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 of uh, continuous variables in the space. Um, and uh, one interesting fact is that, you know, you can, you can try to say that if I had such a system in the brain, and if I were to record in one of these neurons, and, and this was how the nervous system was, was uh, representing the, 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 the position of the animal, what type of cells do I expect to get? And uh, so here, uh, we're going to record, for instance, from this cell. So the, this is the pattern of activity on the, on, the, on the line or ring attractor, which moves with the animal, and we are going to record from that particular cell. I'm going to show spikes here whenever there is activity in this neuron. So the animal, if it starts moving around, what you're going to get is that um, you, the same pattern of activity is going to be represented on the on the physical environment as where as a selectivity of this of, of this particular neuron. So you're expecting that if you record from a, a part of the brain that is involved in the formation of a spatial memory, and and that this mechanism that that one proposes is correct, you're going to say, get cells that, are, that show localized selectivity for the position of the animal, okay? Um, and this is indeed what you get. Um, this, is, this, this was a major discovery by 
um, John O'Keefe and Dostrovsky in 1971, where they recorded from the hippocampus, the same area that I showed at the very beginning in the, in the slide, uh, the homolog of, of, of which was a simple one-layer network in the, in the lizard. Um, if you record from this, what you're going to get is, is this thing that I'm showing here. So it's a two-dimensional environment, a box, where the animal is moving around. Um, the black lines are the trajectory of the animal, uh, where, whatever it is. And whenever, at any point, the one particular cell, say cell one, is generating a spike, um, there's a dot. And what you can see is a simple two-dimensional two version of what I just showed you. Okay? So you get these localized patterns of activity. Different cells are selective to different positions in a space. And this is just a smoothed version of, of, of the same pattern of activity. These are called place cells for obvious reasons. And, and this is what we think forms the, the neural basis of, of the um, memory of the space in the mammalian nervous system. Um, so in, this, is, this, is, this is something that was discovered in, the seven, in 71, but it's not the only place where we get select, spatially selective uh, responses in the nervous system that is related to this memory of space. Um, what, if you look at this other guy that is running around here, there's a recording from another part of the brain called the anthrinal cortex. And there's a particular cell, the rat is moving around, and whenever there, that, that particular neuron generates a spike, you get a, um, a, 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 dot, a white dot on the surface. And if you fast forward, this other part of the brain doesn't show a localized pattern of activity, but if you wait long enough, such that the animal has navigated and, and covered the space, you see that the, a kind of a regular pattern uh, emerges, which, uh, which happens to form a hexagonal, triangular or hexagonal pattern. Um, so this is another, another place where you have uh, a, a, a selectivity for space. Um, it, is, it is in this other part of the brain called the anthrinal cortex. This is very close to the hippocampus. It's actually the gateway to the hippocampus where where, um, where the place cells were, um, were recorded. So this is kind of the, the, the area that, that feeds um, to the hippocampus and receives input from e almost everywhere else in the cortex. Okay. So this, this, this kind of pattern um, emerges almost from a large number of cells in the anthrinal cortex and was also a major discovery in, the, in our understanding of this part of the brain. And uh, naturally, it led people to work on how this can be generated in the nervous system. Let me, before telling you that, um, tell you a little bit about the properties of these cells. These are called grid cells, hexagonal grid cells. This is another example of, of a cell. This is, again, a two-dimensional um, square box. The animal has been moving around. The, the gray that I'm not sure if you can see um, is the trajectory of the animal. Whenever there is a, there is a spike, the the, 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 there's a black dot on the surface. So if you look at this cell, um, there are three things that define each grid cell. Um, there's a grid scale, which is the distance between the peaks of the activity of the, of the grid. Okay? So here, if you're considering a, a, a blue grid cell and a green grid cell, uh, one of them has a bigger spacing between its fields than, than the other one. There's a grid orientation, so this, this grid pattern can be rotated to different degrees. And there is the grid phase, which um, essentially is some sort of distance of one of the peaks from a, a position in the space that, that, that you pick. So the cells have, these cells have a number of remarkable properties besides their hexagonal pattern, which is very interesting. Um, one of their remarkable properties is that if you look at their grid scaling, um, that is a distance between the fields, how, how far these things are from each other, it, it doesn't form a continuum. You have a range of them in your brain, well, in the rat's brain, 
Um, but but that, that scale does not form a continuum. Indeed, if you look at the probability distribution of the recorded grids, what you see is that uh, there is the smallest grid size, that you know, there's a, there's a uh, distribution around it around the size L. Then you get another peak, which happens to be at 1.42 times L, then 1.42 squared times L, and, and so on. So there is a geometric. Sorry? How many neurons? Sorry? This is just one neuron. Like one neuron. This is one neuron. Each one, each single neuron shows this hexagonal pattern. If you record from another neuron, it might have a, it will show geometrically the same pattern, but it will be scaled, rotated, or, or with a different phase. Okay? Wait, the pattern of the neuron, pat activity pattern of the neuron. This is, this is the response of one neuron. The response of one neuron at a position in space. Yes. A, a vague response, the monitor response. Sorry? It's monitor, so what is the geometry of this picture? So this is, this is a two-dimensional box, like I showed before. Maybe we can go back to this other. So if you look at this, so this is the rat. This is a two-dimensional environment. Um, there is an electrode in the brain of the rat where one of the cells is being recorded from, okay? Whenever that particular cell, that cell, generates a spike, there will be a dot here, okay? And what you see is that that pattern of activity and the tissue, on the, sorry, on the, on, the, on, the, on the environment generates, forms a hexagonal pattern. From one neuron to another, you'll get a different um, orientation, spacing, or, or, or um, phase but you, you get this type of hexagonal pattern. Um, but there is, but there, is, there is regularities not only in this, but there is regularities in, for instance, how the scales change. So from one neuron to another neuron, you know, some neurons have bigger distances between their, their, the peak activity that they show here. Um, some neurons are closer to each other. The, 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 the peak activity that they show are closer to each other. Now, if you um, look at the histogram of, of such a measurement, what you see is that you can identify a certain number of peaks, and the mean of those peaks show a geometric uh, progression. Okay, so it's a, um, it, it depends on the environment. It's of the order of I mean I think this is kind of the, I mean if you have a say a two by two square meter environment, you'll get um, five six peaks. Okay, so it could be that you know if you if you have a much bigger environment, there will be another peak further. Away, okay. Yes. No, no. That's an interesting thing. That that that. And I'll tell you how you know that uh, that why that would happen. No, um, the, the 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 animal actually runs around with with changing velocity. Okay, so it uh, it kind of stand here for a few seconds and then start running around. But but in a sense, what what the neuron does or what this network does integrates that that velocity and, and manages to, you know, act, be active at the same position regardless of how fast it goes or how small it goes. And this you can prove, this, you, this exact technique is used. This is experimentation. This is experiments. You know, if you can still, for example, smell. Oh, so, well, I mean, what you can, do, that's, a, that's a good point. So, a lot of effort in getting these results published has been in actually doing those tests. That, you know, you clean the environment, you make sure there is no sort of, you know, source of smell or... or that could well be... The I think, I think, I think that's, that may, may be the case, but I think that uh, you will be a very smart or interesting rat to put your smell spot on the hexagonal pattern. I think then you ask the question, how the rat happens to know, I mean, you see, I mean, the rat should have a hexagonal representation in Spain to say that now I want to. Right. Yes. No, that's what I'm saying. I think. Good point. No one has done that experiment, but I think that's a very, 
that, that kind of causal relationship between the, 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 this representation and, and, and whether the sense of smell, sorry, the sense of <laughs> position is not, has not been explored. But I, I think it's irrelevant to that. I mean, the, the thing is that no, the, the thing is that it it may be that the rat is putting some marks or something, but it has to have something that tells it this is the positions of this. You know. No, I, I don't think they have annihilated the smell system. Yeah, but uh, no, they, they haven't, they haven't, they haven't asked the rat not to leave a mark. I mean, that's. Okay. Was there another question somebody had? Yes. Oh yeah, so this is, this is of course, I mean, this is 1.42 in biological measurements. So it's plus minus, I don't know, three. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, I think it's plus minus there, point oh five or something. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty visible if you see it. Um, it's, I mean, admittedly, it's a very difficult way of defining square root of two, but that seems to be the way the rats do it. Um, so, sorry, I don't hear. Yes, you, 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 yeah, so the, the variance also increases, yes. Good, I don't, I don't know. So that is, that is one of the things that, you know, if, if some of you want to work on answering these questions, I mean, working on interesting problems without the possibility of getting a job afterwards, all these questions are, are very welcome to be addressed. What is the scale compared to the size of the rat in this question? Hmm? It's uh, the rat is like say this size, exactly right. yeah. And and you, you can you can look at the mice and no, it's the same. It's smaller. It it doesn't seem to be correlated with the exactly. no. And you have you know you have bigger scales. You have much smaller ones. Let me move uh, a bit forward. Um, so so uh, and and, and they, the, the, the one one last thing. This uh, this kind of scale kind of. Uh, um, modularity is not only in the scale. That is, the neurons that, the cells that have similar scales, they tend to have similar orientation and similar phase. They seem, to, and they tend to respond to the external manipulations of the environment together. So they really form this kind of functional modules that, 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 that exist in the, in the medial and trinal cortex. Yes, I think, I think they, they, I mean, one idea, there are several ways that that can be done. One of them that I will talk about is that it is integrating the velocity of the animal that is encoded in some motor area or. Velocity, not acceleration. No, velocity. Oh. Because it is a position, the integral of velocity is position. Velocity is acceleration. Why not so on? So some of the measures So, um. I mean, the, the way to get this in the, the hexagonal pattern in, 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 in 2D is not actually very different from, from the 1D uh, place cell that I just told you. So what you di what did here was that, you know, you have a translational invariant connectivity leading to a translational invariant activity in, uh, in one dimension, and uh, that led to, the, to what we call the grid cell. So the, the key observation is that the pattern of activity that you get by doing this looks like the same as you know the pattern of activity that, that is on the you reflect that in the in the space. So the main the same idea can be used, and it was proposed by MacNaughton and others very early after the, the discovery of grid cells. That all you need to do is really to generate a translational invariant hexagonal pattern in 2D, 
and then just translate that with the animal's motion. Okay? So you need a velocity signal to the neurons so that you move the, the pattern of activity in the same way that you moved it here. Um, but the key question then is, uh, I mean, there are several questions. One of them that I'd like to answer is, is how can you generate the hexagonal pattern in the, in the network? Okay? So you see there's two steps involved. This one, the, the generation of the hexagonal pattern in 2D, and then the movement. Um, I'd like to focus mainly on, on this part um, and tell you why I think, uh, to some degree, this is possible. So we know of a lot of hexagonal patterns in the, in the, in the, in the world. And one of them that probably a lot of people here are familiar with are abricots of vortices in type two superconductors. So here what you have is essentially a system where you have a superconductor subject to, to, to external magnetic field. And if the external magnetic field is bigger than a certain uh, critical limit, what you get is to form these vortices that in an ideal um, homogeneous uh, and, uh, environment that will form a hexagonal pattern. Okay, um, and this was observed experimentally here and was first predicted by Aprikosov. So why do they form this thing? Why do the vortices form in a, in a hexagonal, uh, they form in a hexagonal pattern? The reason is that they have an antiferromagnetic interaction. So vortex-vortex interaction is antiferromagnetic and with, with a boundary condition that is appropriate and no inhomogeneity, the maximal packing is, is the is the hexagonal um, organization of the, of the vortices. So you can think about it in the same way in the nervous system. Um, the question then is, um, does this kind of competitive antiferromagnetic interaction exist? And does this corresponding external field exist too? Uh, so the answer to this question, it's, a, it's not a very easy question to answer, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but that was something that we tried to do with some collaborators in the, in the, in Trondheim. So, for those of you who don't know, the, the, the cortex of mammals form a, a kind of layered structure, okay? And so this is for layer one, two, three, you can, you can probably observe the difference in the density and the, the, the size of the cells in this, in this picture. So it happens to be the case where that in the layer two of the entrinal cortex, the, the cells that are grid cells, you can identify them in vitro. They are, they are what's called the stellate cells. And if you look at them under the microscope with trained eyes, you can, you can, you can identify these little stellate cells and from their physiological properties. So if you'd like, oh, I have to say something else. It is very difficult to record from pairs of neurons in, in, in vivo. Um, from inside the cells, okay? So if you want to measure connectivity in the nervous system, one of the things that people do is to, is to put one electrode inside one cell, put another electrode inside another cell, and then inject a current in one and record from the other one. Most often you don't get any signal because it's a sparse network. Sometimes you get a signal and that indicates some sort of interaction between the neurons. That kind of experiments you can do in vitro. In vivo, it is extremely difficult if you actually can do it. So uh, we've been lucky in a sense that in layer two of the medial and trinal cortex, you can identify grid cells in, in, the, in, in, in vitro. And you can put them under the microscope and do this measurement that I just said. You can do it in vitro. This is a very difficult measurement. So you know, a postdoc, Jay Quay, spent five, six years on just doing this, this measurement. And uh, there was a kind of a surprising result, which was the following. So these recordings are done from, uh, so this is four cells that are being recorded at the same time under the microscope. Uh, these three are being stimulated externally, and a measurement is being done from this one, okay? And what, sim what happens is that if you look at the, the the membrane potential of cell, this, this cell one, which is being recorded from while you stimulate these other three, you get a decrease in the membrane potential, which means there's an in effective inhibitory interaction between these cells and these ones, and so on for the other ones, okay? And uh, 
this is a very, this was a very weird observation for the following reason. That is, these cells are known to be excitatory. I mean, they release excitatory neurotransmitters, okay? But when we, when we were recorded from them, you observe some sort of effective inhibition. What that means is likely, uh, we don't know still the mechanism, but what possible mechanism is that these cells project to an inhibitory interneuron, which then projects back to, to, um, to, to these cells, okay? So it's, it's, you think about it, it's a very unique type of connectivity pattern. So there are these cells that are all excitatory. They happen not to talk to each other. If you look at the, so this is a distribution of the excitatory signal uh, an inhibitory signal that was observed at different stages of development. So early in the, in, the, in, the, in the rat's life, you have a little bit of excitation and no inhibition. The situation completely reverses when you, when you go to adult uh, rats, where you have predominantly inhibition between pairs of stellate cells, pairs of grid cells, and no excitation, okay? So, this seems to be exactly the type of connectivity that you'd require for, the, for having a, a, a kind of a hexagonal pattern that, that I just suggested, and indeed that will be the case. So if you just make a network that, that pairs of neurons um, interact with each other with a very simple connectivity pattern. So if they are connected, then they inhibit each other with a constant magnitude. This is in the, in the, in the, well, depends what, which physical you mean, spatials, yeah, spatials. So this is, this is separation not on the t neural tissue, but on the space that they would have uh, been assigned to in the, in the, but that's a, that's a, that's a very, I'll, 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 I'll get to back to that in a, in a, hmm? This is the cage space, yes. Um, or, or the spatial phase space of the, of the neurons. So if you make a network like this and you, know, you wire them together, you'll get you know, your natural uh, pattern of activity when you have no inhomogeneity is a, is, a, is a hexagonal pattern. And now you can repeat the same thing that we talked about uh, in the case of place cells. Uh, you know, you can change the scaling and the height of these patterns by varying these two parameters. Um, and now if you move this pattern and you record from a cell cell at the center of the, uh, of, of this uh, network, which, and this is what, what, what we are doing here. So this pattern is moving with the animal. The trajectory of the animal is, is, is this uh, pattern here, the gray. And whenever this neuron in the center fires or whenever there is a pat bump of activity on that, oops, sorry on that uh, on that position there is a there is a spike that's being uh, that's being generated and I think given the the 1d example that we showed you can convince yourself that uh, if you wait long enough and this covers the space you're going to get a hexagonal pattern now um, of course if the animal starts moving faster this bumps start moving faster and what is going to happen is that you still get a hexagonal pattern, but the peaks of activity will be closer to each other, okay? So essentially, the different scales of the, of the grid cells can be thought of as neurons that respond to the velocity in different ways. I mean, the, 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 the how strongly they respond to the same velocity will, be, will, will determine what's the distance between, between the peaks here, okay? Any questions about this? No? The motion of the red, the terrible red in this picture. Sorry? The motion itself of, of the red, how random it is, how the red. The motion of the red. Yeah. How, how is it organized? Is there any way to define the red, the red motion? You know, I really wish I had that, the answer to that question, and I think that's a really important question. So the, the, the experimental is in this field. So the question is um, the motion of the rat. How is the motion of the rat? Is the random walk, does it? To my knowledge, no one has studied that carefully, and they should. I mean, that's probably the first thing you'd want to do. But people who work in this field, and that's very frustrating for my, me, they do all these very complicated experiments, 
which are you know recording from four cells at the same time while the animal I don't know is talking to another animal and watching a movie. They they do all sorts of things, but the simple question that no one has done, no one has ever sat and looked at a rat that's running around and quantify what's the pattern of movement. I think that's extremely crucial for several reasons, um, but but I I I, I don't know what. Here, it's, it seems to be you know, a kind of random walk, but probably the irregularities that no one has carefully studied. Definitely is not that the rat moves with a constant velocity. Definitely it's not the pat that, that, the, that the rat is just doing a diffusive motion, because the stamp. Uh, that's the key point, but I think that, for instance, to a large extent depends on the environment. On, on, on what the animal wants to do. I mean, whether the animal is just bored doing no, wants do nothing or there is a goal in the environment. These are not things that I know of being in study. So this, this pattern just emerges and that would be like a model of, of, uh, of this. So it seems that you know, there is at least to some quantita qualitative scale in one of the layers of the entorhinal cortex, we have the required connectivity. So, but in the other layers, we can't answer this question using in vitro measurements. Why? Because the grid cells there are not identifiable under the microscope. You, know, you can identify them in vivo when the rat is alive, but if you want to measure their connectivity, you have to kill the animal and take the part of the brain under the microscope, in which case you don't know whether that was a grid cell or it wasn't. Okay? So one indirect way of looking at that is, is kind of doing inverse problem. Uh, and the main idea is, again, the following. So you have neurons that you have recorded from the brain, and what you're trying to say is that, well, these neurons are correlated, and if I have a reasonable model of the correlations, I should be able to recover the kind of interactions that, that they, 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 they should have had in the, in, the, in the brain to have generated this pattern that I've seen. So this is something we tried to do. Uh, the idea was to look at the following case. You have a, you consider kind of a kinetic Ising model. There is a, there's a Markov chain that is trying to represent the activity of a particular neuron at any given time, given the configuration of the activity of neurons in the previous time step. Okay, some sort of this. So this is the recording, you discretize it in time, and you just consider if there was a spike, there is a one, if there was no spike, there is a minus one. And just you try to look at this dynamical pattern as a kinetic Ising model. And you have external fields, you have interactions between these neurons, and then you try to fit this model to your, to your data. And you interpret this kind of interactions as, as the, um, kind of effective connectivity that, that should exist in the, in the system. Um, so this is what we did. And the way, the way you actually fit the model is itself an interesting problem. It's kind of a, what you can call, it's an inverse statistical physics problem. So in typical statistical physics problem, you have interactions and you have external fields and you want to calculate various green functions of the system. Here you are doing the opposite. You are given these things and your job is to infer the interactions in the external fields. And you can do that by doing maximum likelihood on the, um, so you just look at the data that you have, the history that you recorded, you calculate what is the probability of, the, of, of observing that history under the model that you have given a set of parameters. And um, by the choice of the, by the shape, choice of the shape of the distribution that we, we choose, this you can, you, can, you can prove that this, this has a unique um, optima which, which you can achieve by doing gradient ascent or other approximations. Uh, and once you do that, here is when you apply this framework on, on actual recordings from, the, from various layers of the, of the entrinal cortex. So what you see is this. This is, um, the, the, the inferred connections as a function of the distance in the, in the physical space, okay? How close the neurons were firing to each other. So you see that neurons that fire to near each other, they tend to be excitatory, they tend to excite each other, have positive interactions, 
whereas when they go further away, they have negative ones. And they, it, this is kind of repeated in different data sets, except for this case, which the, this is a case that the, the, the distance between the fields was too big. So I, I, I think we just did not have enough data to, to have a good recovery of the interaction. So it seems to have the right type of qualitatively the right type of interaction that you need to have to generate a hexagonal pattern. And that is you, the, 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 the key thing that you need is this inhibitory tail. That is at long distances, they, they inhibit each other. And this seems to be the case, but you can uh, say that this is, this is extremely noisy. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not the nice, you know, translationally invariant pattern that, 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 that you want to have. So um, this, of course, begs the question of what happens if you, if you have this noisy pattern. And if you have this noisy connectivity pattern, everything disintegrates, unless you have some other comforting mechanism. The reason is this. So, you know, if you have a kind of a pattern that, that has the long range inhibitory interaction, you can construct some sort of, and it's, you know, it's nice and smooth, and it's translationally invariant. You have a nice um, uh, kind of marginal, marginally stable direction in your free energy landscape where the things can move. So as a, as a response to the signal of the, of the velocity of the animal, the pattern can move along here, and that's what we saw in the simulations that I showed you. But if you have a noisy interaction pattern, which seems to be the case in, 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 in data that I showed you, your free energy landscape is not nice and smooth, but it's very rugged. And what that causes is that, is that now the movement of the animal is not going to be smooth with the movement of the, I'm sorry, the movement of the pattern will not be as, as smooth as the movement of the animal. So the pattern is going to be stuck every now and then in some of these places. And what will happen is that Although you might have a perfect hexagonal pattern in the, in the network, as the animal moves, that would not be represented in the firing pattern of an individual cell, okay? So what you are going to get is essentially no observable pattern. And in fact, yes? That is perfectly uh, possible, right? But I think it is much more likely that it is the, I mean, so if you only have, say, about 5% noise in this interaction, everything disintegrates. And I think that it is more likely that that 5% noise exists. Of course, it could be the, in, sorry? No, there is no, the, you know, the only, so the only, um, actual measurements of the interactions that I am aware of, of the, of the, was the one that I showed you before, the, the inhibitory interactions in layer two. And even in that area, I didn't show you the, the histogram of the, of, of the activity, but you can see it is pretty, it is, it is, pre, it is variable. I mean, it, it, is, it is within what you need to get a hexagonal pattern. So in that respect, it is pretty stable. It is inhibitory and, but it has, you know, five, way over 5% noise in, in, a, in, its, uh, in its connectivity. And so I, 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 what I think is that um, this is real. That is, you, you really have to deal with this issue of noise. Yes. Can, can you talk louder? So, so that's, a, that's a very, very good point. So the point that she's making is that you could also do the inference on the case that you had the data from, right? You, we, we have the layer two where we know what the connectivity is, okay, at least in vitro, okay? So why don't we go and do the reconstruction on the layer two data and see whether we recover the same, the actual measurements? Well, the answer to that is that now, if you look at in vivo recordings, people don't record from one layer because they don't know which layer they are in. So they record from all over the place, 
So what we tried to do is this, in this data set, we tried to look at cells that happened to have been recorded from layer two, but there were like three cells. So it, we, couldn't, we couldn't do that. So ideally what you'd like to do is somebody recording from, you know, 15,000 cells in the anthrinal cortex and, you know, 50 of them happen to be in layer two and then we could do this, but, you know, people don't survive the lab for 15,000 neurons. So it's too long. But that's a, that's, a, that's a great, that's the first thing we tried, but there were not enough layer two cells to, to test that. Uh, so I, what I think is that, um, you know, the, 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 the upshot of the analysis is that even a small amount of noise destroys the continuous attractor and we have to deal with this problem. I think it is real. Um, because it's very hard to imagine having a trend. I mean, it's, it's hard to have smooth and nice things in a biological system. It doesn't. And, and, um, and uh, I think it has to be dealt with somehow. I think there is a role for this attractor type of dynamics because you see, I mean, by the fact that you have this interaction pattern, you will have some sort of attractors formed. Now the translation of that pattern, the smooth translation of that pattern is not going to happen with this connectivity. You probably need some other mechanisms that maybe locally smooth the, the free energy surface, um, but I don't know how that, I mean, this is another problem. If you don't want to get a job, work on this. this is um, so let me just in the last, Sorry? The this base laminar structure before training, the IDF structure. Our regular is working on training the what? Laminar, you say. Uh huh, yeah, laminar. So it's exactly laminar dimension two, two dimension laminar in one sense laminar. Oh, it, there are different layers of the cortex. No, but this can be an MQ. That's an MQ which we find, right? No, no, no. Before no. you make training, of course. No, this is, the, this is, if you get the cortex and you cut it, put it under the microscope, you get six layers. There's no. This laminar structure that has uh, interaction between neurons is a particular regular pattern. Uh, you no, what I said was that um, in the layer two, in this layer of entrinal cortex, the cells that show that hexagonal pattern, they are morphologically and physiologically identifiable in vitro. Okay, that is. I can say that this, not even for sure, but you know, with a high probability, I can say that this cell is going to be likely to have a, to be a great cell. Let me continue and then, uh, so let me now finish the talk by talking about a little bit of a more interesting theoretical concept. Um, I think, uh, this is historically backwards. This is probably the first thing I did, but um, um, I think I should have done it later in my life. Uh, now, suppose you, I mean, most objects, most types of information that you want to deal with in the, in the real world is neither a, a discrete point or nor a continuum. There are probably all sorts of combinations of these things, say an object in a particular position, a person in a particular room, um, and, and, and these are probably the kind of information that the, the nervous system is operating on at, a, at any time. And uh, so how can, you, how can you have things like this? How can you have this kind of combination of, of patterns? Simple idea is this. Um, you essentially get the ring attractor and you get the you know, helpful type of interaction patterns and you combine them, you end up with you know, something like this, which is a convolution, a kind of, not the convolution, but um, a kind of uh, a convolved, or convolution, I don't know. You multiply this with this, and, uh, and, 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 and you get a pattern of activity that, you get an interaction pattern that has both features. I mean, it has a component that is, that is translational invariant and distance dependent, and you have a component that comes from the, the interaction, the, the interaction between the, stored memories. 
uh, a more likely scenario is probably that you have neurons that what we know in the nervous system is that the probability of connectivity decays with distance. So a natural choice is that you have a connectivity pattern that looks like this. You have a, you have a variable, say CIJ, that encodes whether there is a connection between a pair of neurons or not, and that probability decays with distance. And then on top of that, you have a stored memories that, that, that happen to be stored due to the synaptic plasticity and, and uh, heavy, and, heavy and learning. So um, this, this was something that we analyzed some time ago with Alessandro Travis. Um, and this is, I mean, theoretically, this is a very interesting problem for a couple of reasons. One of them is that since the connectivity is not symmetric, I mean, it's a probabilistic mechanism whether there is an interaction or not, um, there is no Hamiltonian for this system and there's no detailed balance. Second, since you have a, you have a, you're introducing a space to your system, you will have, uh, you will have to deal with order parameters that are not just a dot product of a stored memory and what you have uh, at, the, at the current activity pattern, but a more complex field that, 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 that locally tells you whether, the, which pattern is similar to the current activity. Um, of course, from having this, this kind of, uh, order parameter, by integrating it, you just recover the dot product. Um, so this is more general than that, of course. But this is the object that your system has to deal with. So uh, as a consequence of this one, and a little bit of this one, the standard spring glass techniques that were used to, gen to analyze um, Hopfield model will not be applicable here. You don't have a Hamiltonian, you don't have a free energy. But there's some other ways you can deal with this thing, and I'll just briefly tell you how to do it. Um, the main idea is that, you know, you get, what you do is that you consider a single cell or a single spin that receives input from other spins through this interaction and a nonlinear function. You can rewrite this field in terms of this local field overlaps, and you make an assumption, which is you're interested in fixed points where one of these guys has a non-zero value and the other ones are fluctuating around zero. And then if you plug this thing back in there, you'll get a, f a self-consistent set of equations for these field parameters, okay? The problem is that, I mean, this is, this is essentially the idea. Then there is a bunch of tricks that you have to deal with. Um, the reason is that, you know, when you take thermodynamic limit and you want to solve these problems, uh, the number of patterns you have to send to infinity, and therefore, um, you know, you, 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 have, you have infinitely many equations that you have that are coupled and you have to solve them. Uh, so any non-zero, slightly non-zero solution to one of these equations can have a big impact on, 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 on everybody else. But you can deal with that by looking at the statistical distribution of, of the solutions of these things, and that's what uh, we did. You can build a phase diagram of this and, and see that, for instance, if uh, as a function of the width of the connectivity to the size of the system, you get a decrease of the, of the storage capacity of the, of the system. The main reason being that, you know, when you have localized connectivity, you, you essentially are using fewer of your interactions to encode memory, so the, the decay in the index. Um, the activity profiles look, have an interesting feature. So, uh, if you look at the stable fixed point of the system, the overlap, the, the, uh, the measure of similarity of the activity of the pattern with the stored memory uh, uh, takes the shape that, that, that you, you want to have. That is, there is non, one of them is non-zero at a certain position in space, the others are zero. Your activity pattern is also localized in space and basically what this figure is showing you is that there is a localized pattern of activity as a fixed point, and it is correlated with one of the stored memories. Okay, this will end up being your, your, your fixed point solutions. Now you can use the following idea to you know, encode the position of this bump of activity as say the position of an object or a continuum, va continuous variable that's associated to an object, and um, the detailed pattern as what object it it was, say, that's what I call what information and where information. 
Okay? So it's a simple combination of a continuous variable and discrete variable combined together and you want to represent them. But um, given what I just told you uh, about noise and, 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 and fluctuations and how that destroys continuous attractors, you can easily convince yourself that you cannot have this pattern everywhere. Okay? There's some sort of, um, th this, th th this system is not self-averaging if you want to think about the, 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 the statistical physics um, jargon that, that the first read. So although if you let, get the system and average over the distribution of the stored patterns, you get nice and smooth translational invariant solution, on any single realization, what's going to happen is that the uh, patterns of activity are going to prefer certain positions in this, in this space. And I'm showing this here. So this pattern of activity, if we get it from this position, for instance, you initialize the pattern of activity at this position and you let it go, what is going to happen is that it's going to drift away and find a preferred position very soon and get a stock there. Okay, it wouldn't stay there. What does that mean? That means that if you want to use this process to store memory of, of objects and their position, you're going to lose the information about the position very soon, okay? And this is shown also here, so that each of these dots is a center of inserting position, these green points, and the red points is where the pattern ended up after we, we, we run the, we let the system equilibrate. And you can see that uh, out of all these starting points, you'll just end up in a, in a small number of, of, uh, of final fixed points. So the information that you can have about object position is going to be lost. And the information in this example, the information that you will have about the object identity is going to be retained. Uh, the, you can deal with this problem by again locally smoothening the surface of the free energy. How you do that is um, through what's called a gain modulation. That's one mechanism you can try to do. Um, for instance, what you can do is to look at this area when, and, and assume that neurons that are active, they also increase their gain. So gain is essentially this, um, this uh, slope of this input-output function. So if you do that, um, any position can be stable because what you're essentially doing is that you have this rugged free energy landscape and you make one point particularly deeper and that point is the point that you put the object in. Free energy maybe is a bad word. I mean, it's not, there is no free energy in that sense, but you can, what you can do a posteriori in this space of the, of the, of the, uh, of the um, order parameters, you can write an effective action that describes locally the dynamics of the system. So what you just do is that the way that I said, you write down uh, mean field equations or self-consistent equations and you can assume that locally the dynamics is governed by the right hand of the fixed point equation minus the left hand plus some noise. Oh. Um, and in that space, this, this is a, this, uh, so in the, at, the, at the microscopic level, the this, this level of spins, you don't have a Hamiltonian, but at the macroscopic level with the order parameters, you can write an effective action that describes the dynamics. So that's what I mean by the, by the free energy. Um, so this will work, that is, it will, it will allow you to store both position and identity, but it comes with an interesting drawback. So this figure that I just showed you, you lost the information about where you started. If you do this gain modulation, you will actually stay very close to where you started, but you notice these things that I have put it black. What these are, are cases where the information about the object identity was lost, okay? So you can do gain modulation and locally stabilize your pattern, retain memory about the position of, the, of an object, but then there's a trade-off. You lose information about the identity. Why? Because you're, you're messing with the, with the interaction between the neurons. There is, an there is an interaction pattern that was developed through heavy and learning that is optimal for this retrieval of the pattern. Now in order to stabilize, to force the pattern to stay in a particular position, you're changing the gain of neurons and that will 
that will mess with the way this interaction neurons are interacting with each other, and that will that will essentially lead to the loss of identity information. You can quantify that if you plot as a function of this gain modulation. So this is when there, this side is when there is no gain modulation. This side is when there is a lot of gain modulation, and this is for different number of stored patterns. And in all of them, what you can see is that when there is no gain modulation, you have information about you 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 have information about the identity of the object, and you can keep that, but you have essentially zero information after a few seconds about the identity of the object, about the position of the object, and the story kind of turns in another way. So this is, I think, in a sense, um, and probably this is something that is, if it's happening in the nervous system, it is something that is dynamically happening, depending on the tasks that you are trying to do. That is, um, Adrian talked about gain modulation, and I think this is, a, this is a very important process that then the nervous system, not only depending on the stimuli that it gets, but based on the tasks that it has to do, it is capable to, of adjusting its, its, its kind of um, input-output properties so that you know, it can operate at different points in, 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 in on, the, on this um, continuums. So um, let me summarize. We talked about point attractors that can be stored using Hebbian cell assemblies, continuous attractor with translationally invariant connectivity can store continuous variables, but they suffer from drift and talked about the combination of them. But let me tell you what I think is the future. But this, is, this is probably the, the slide that I'd like you to remember. So we talked about this simple space, that a two-dimensional space that, you know, I think, think that a two-dimensional space that the animal can live in is composed of a bunch of, you know, more local spaces. And that a place cell essentially encodes one of these positions. So when the animal is here, this place cell activates. When the animal is here, this place cell activates. And the grid cells, in a sense, provide a metric in that space, some sort of distance measure uh, on, 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 on this, on this two-dimensional flat surface. So this is a very interesting system that we have where we can study this, this, this uh, kind of um, how, how uh, navigation in this environment and how these codes that exist for each individual position here relate to a metric or vice versa. There's, there's an interaction between these, these to each other. I think this is, this is a very interesting case that we have found some kind of animal, that is a rat, and some kind of task that is a spatial navigation for which we can actually study this thing carefully. But I think at the higher level, what you really want to do is a bigger thing. That is, these positions are not only nearest neighbors. There are some sort of more complicated manifolds. I mean, I'm just showing here um, just changes in curvature, and uh, they are all continuous manifolds, but they can be much more complex manifolds of information and different episodes, different experiences, and they have some sort of not metric relationship, but, but neighborhood relationship. And, you know, a, a thought process, kind of, you know, thinking or, or cognitive activities essentially mean that you're navigating in this, in this big space of, of manifolds of experiences and memories. And I think one very interesting question that one can ask and, and, and um, probably predict something is what type of neural representations you're going to get if you, if you try to study what is, say, the metric that, that I mean, metric is not the right word because here you're just having a neighborhood relationship in a graph. But if you want to navigate in a space like this, the same way that animal wants to navigate in a, in a two-dimensional space, what type of representations do you want to end up with having? We know that in a flat two-dimensional surface, we have a hexagonal pattern but I doubt that would be the case in here. But likely, I mean, if we, if we work on this, we'll be able to predict and, and think about what, what would be the representation. So there are different ways that one can approach this problem. One of them is through the you know, mathematical frameworks and things that I have discovered by continuing this further. But there is another one that I want to ab advocate, which is through reading more stories. So um, the grid cells were discovered in 2005. And in 1962, Jorge Luis Borges in the library of Babel said, 
Idealists argue that the hexagonal rooms are the necessary shape of absolute space, or at least of our perception of space. So maybe if we read Borges earlier, we did not have to do experiments. So if you read more of Borges, maybe you can predict what's going to happen in the more complex manifolds. And these are the people who had done a lot of the work here, particularly these three. This is a pre-PhD photo of Ben, but uh, this was the only one I found now. And Ari and Maria and a number of other people that three years I have worked with. Thank you very much.